we'll just throw that uh, can of worms into this um, video and, and see what happens in the comment section. <laughs> Hit me, producer pots. The low FODMAP diet seems to be gaining traction again as a solution for a slew of gut health issues. What are low FODMAPs and are there any benefits or harm in avoiding them long-term as a dietary template? Low FODMAP diets are really gaining traction again. I've been seeing them pop up all over social media recently. That's interesting that they're gaining in popularity. So FODMAPs are a class of carbohydrates, mainly types of fiber that are highly fermentable. So FODMAP actually stands for fermentable oligosaccharide, uh, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols, which are uh, like sugar alcohols. So they, the thing they have in common is they tend to have a lot of fructose in them. They tend to be great food for our gut bacteria, and it is they're really like high fermentability, meaning our gut bacteria can use them as food and produce things like gas and short chain fatty acids as a result of their metabolism. It's the high bacterial activity and the products of that bacterial activity that's actually responsible for symptoms that look like irritable bowel syndrome. So symptoms that people find are sometimes alleviated by a low FODMAP diet would include gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, uh, excess uh, flatulence, belching, uh, berberygmy, which is the technical term for when your stomach makes rumbling noises, um, which is my fun fact of the day. Uh, so all of those symptoms can be helped by a low FODMAP diet. The challenge is there's quite a few studies, uh, actually even you know quite recent studies like done over the last five to 10 years, that have shown that low FODMAP diets actually cause undesirable shifts in the gut microbiome, both in healthy like controls for these studies, as well as people with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So it's kind of a catch-22 because irritable bowel syndrome is a uh, disease of exclusion, so or diagnosis of exclusion. So if you have GI symptoms and it's not inflammatory bowel disease, or celiac disease, or diverticular disease, or a, an ulcer, or uh, you know, cancer. If it's none of those other things, then you go, congratulations, you have an irritable bowel. And uh, as somebody who has gone through this diagnostic process, I can say, yeah, I know. That's why I came here in the first place, doc. Thanks so much for letting me know. I have the thing that I let you know that I, I have. And then we did all that testing and you were like, you have the thing you know you have then we're, we can't do anything about it other than treat the symptoms. So it is a very frustrating uh, condition to have. It definitely erodes quality of life. Um, people tend to either have IBS-C, where the C stands for constipation, or IBS-D, where the D stands for diarrhea, but some people have both and kind of swing between both. And uh, it seems to be potentially like, multifactorial, it tends to have multiple different causes that end up in the same symptoms. So for some people, it can be GI symptoms that are related to a uh, stress-related uh, mental health disorder. So it can be related to anxiety. For other people, it might be related to what's called gut dysbiosis, which is the technical term for any imbalance in the gut microbiome, the community of bacteria and fungi and archaea that live in our digestive tract. So if we have the wrong kinds of microbes in our gastrointestinal tract, the wrong relative balance of different species, um, them living in the wrong locations, and that can kind of refer to like the large intestine versus different segments of the small intestine, but it can also refer to like living in the middle versus like closer to the edges of the, the digestive tube. So um, any kind of imbalance in that community can cause GI symptoms that can result in a, a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. So the challenge with a low FODMAP diet is that yes, like if you just decrease the food for those bacteria, they're producing less of the gas and short chain fatty acids that are driving the symptoms. So it can alleviate symptoms. However, FODMAPs are incredibly important, what's called substrate, means food, for the most beneficial, important species that we can have in our 
gut microbiomes, uh, lactobacillus species, bifidobacterium species. So when we starve the, the imbalance, right? The, maybe the undesirable species that are causing all this excess production of gas uh, that is causing symptoms, we're also starving the good guys. So some of the most important foods for supporting a healthy gut microbiome are high FODMAP foods, right? Foods like onions, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. Um, some of those vegetables that are high FODMAPs are known in a variety of different studies to improve the composition of the gut microbiome. And so now we have these studies where they put healthy people and people with IBS on a low FODMAP diet. They measure what happens to the symptoms. And by the way, not everyone has symptom resolution on a low FODMAP diet, only a subset of people do. Um, so it's not like it's a guarantee if you have IBS that you go low FODMAP that it's going to get better. For some people, it gets worse on low FODMAP. So just FYI, it's it's not a solution that works for everybody. It's a solution that works for a subset of people and potentially people who only have like one type of gut dysbiosis or gut microbiome imbalance that responds to this and other types don't and other potential causes of IBS that don't relate to our gut bacteria don't, right? That's probably what's going on there. Uh, but the problem is, is when you, you starve the bad guys, this also happens on diets like um, GAPS and SCD, which include uh, reducing starches in addition to FODMAP type foods. Um, if you starve the bad guys, you also starve the good guys. And so you end up worsening that, that imbalance over time or developing a different kind of imbalance. And so studies have shown when people are on a low FODMAP diet for as little as a few weeks, they have reduced levels of lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, uh, fecalibacterium protsnitsi, acromantia, mucinophila, which are really, really, really important. They're like keystone species of bacteria. They're some of the most important probiotics that we can have in our gut microbiomes. So low FODMAP diets reduce the growth of these really important bacteria. They do things like reduce the production of short chain fatty acids. So that is a metabolic byproduct of uh, our gut bacteria that is really beneficial for us, but also helps to control the entire gut environment because it lowers the pH. So we actually want a slightly acidic, like uh, contents of, of our digestive tract. All of the good bacteria like to live in a slightly acidic environment, whereas a lot of the pathogens like E. coli thrive on a closer to a neutral pH or even basic environment. It's actually one of the reasons why I don't love alkaline water because it neutralizes acids that are really beneficial for digestion and also beneficial for supporting a healthy gut microbiome. So we'll just throw that uh, can of worms into this um, video and, and see what happens in the comment section. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's the challenge with uh, a low FODMAP diet. Like it can cause symptom resolution, at least on the short term, but even over the short term, it can worsen the underlying problem that is dry, that causes the symptoms. So it doesn't actually help to correct uh, the, the gut dysbiosis that may be at least one of the possible causes of irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert uh, in treating gut dysbiosis or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or any of the other things that can be causing irritable bowel syndrome. But my understanding of like what the, the current sort of standard of practice is, is to use low FODMAP diets as a short-term intervention to reduce symptoms and help restore some quality of life while doing something else to address the underlying challenge. So that something else might be in the case of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it might be a non-absorbable antibiotic like rifaximin in the case of just like an imbalance, it might be prescription probiotics. Uh, it might be diet changes. It might be lifestyle changes. It might be some diagnostics to rule out other possible things going on. So, uh, and then the standard of practice would be to slowly reintroduce back thought maps. So adding as little as maybe a teaspoon uh, per day of some of these types of foods maybe starting with something like sauerkraut that has a lot of the good probiotics in it, in addition to FODMAPs. 
and then slowly increasing, uh, going up every couple of days, because those gut bacteria do take a couple of days to kind of re establish an equilibrium every time you make a diet change. So inching up slowly to kind of reestablish a really healthy gut microbiome over time. All of that being said, that is my understanding of the standard of practice. Again, I am not a doctor. Uh, this would be a situation where you want to work with somebody who's an expert in this field and uh, somebody who's not just recommending a long-term low FODMAP diet. If they're recommending a long-term low FODMAP diet, um, unless you have something like fructose malabsorption, which is a whole separate thing um if if that is not the fructose malabsorption has not been diagnosed there's not a reason for anyone to recommend a, a long-term low fat diet so that would be a sign to me anyways that that is not the expert that i would want to work with so finding somebody who who has experience in in treating irritable bowel syndrome with a combination of diet changes as well as other strategies would be my recommendation the the it's there's so many really really beneficial foods that are eliminated on a low fodmap diet it's not a sustainable approach unless absolutely medical ne medically necessary and again that is a very small percentage of of the people who are being recommended a low fodmap diet and why i'm kind of surprised and a little dismayed that it's gaining in popularity again as a cure all yeah yeah wow um that was so much information and I loved all of that. I learned so much in such a short period of time. That's amazing. I have a feeling this video, we're probably going to get a lot of follow-up questions that sure. will maybe get us more videos on the topic of like gut health, which is great. So I love this so much. Thank you so, so much for this. So um, is there anywhere where someone can learn more about you know, besides like, of course, we want to work with a professional, but there are there any other resources that we have for someone who's dealing with like gut health issues? Yeah. So the reason why I know so much about gut health is that I was working on a gut microbiome book for six years uh, before I stepped away from the project. But I do have an ebook that is uh, huge and incredibly in depth and goes into like all of the research that I had done. So I have an ebook version of what would have eventually and hopefully someday still will become an imprint book. Uh, so that ebook is called the Gut Health Guidebook. I also have a cookbook companion for it called the Gut Health Cookbook. Uh, and that is available on my website, Nutribor.com. So go, go check it out. That is my most in-depth resource on the gut microbiome and it goes into all of the cool species that we want, the the ones that are kind of neutral, the ones that we definitely don't want, and how all different kinds of foods, as well as nutrients, as well as lifestyle factors, influence uh, that that awesome community of microbes that uh, are are like our little pets. We want to look after them because they also look after us. The analogies to a dog just continue when we're talking about our gut bacteria. <laughs> Like a dog gives you quality of life, like so does our gut microbiome. Like it's for do dog people get it, non dog people are like, <laughs> what? Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Sarah. <laughs>